you may uh, be wondering why I call. <laughs> I know I am. <laughs> in fact, I'm trying to remember what I call. Uh, how do you teach this guy? <laughs> I don't know if some of you know where you wound up. This is, after all, a first year class in the law school in talk. That is a four-letter word. <laughs> so be on guard. It's not the unemployment office. <laughs> <laughs> I have no job. Matter of fact, I may lose money. <laughs> I have no stamp. Uh, it's just a first year classroom. So uh, if you've been ripped off and didn't know where you were, we'll uh, give you a few minutes to shuffle out uh, if you want to. In, in the meantime, uh, me in section W, or any of you here, I don't think I <laughs> we're, we're going to have our class in torts this morning. So uh, if you like to stay around, okay, but you know. <coughs> It's just another day. <laughs> now, last time, well, at least, let me pass my class roll around. Will somebody at least sort of hand that over to me? <laughs> Thank you. I don't even have a place in my seating chart. Last time, you may recall, W. We had started wondering a little bit about this concept in tort law that goes under the name of, quote, proximate cause. Quote. Things seem to be happening in the law here, but we are not quite sure what they are. We had wondered about some of the different rationales, some of the different possible explanations that might be given. Well, what the law is really concerned with at this point in a case, and what it seems to be doing. Number one, we had worried a little bit because the law seems to worry a little bit now and then about the overwhelming financial burden being imposed on a defendant in a typical proximate cause type case. And sometimes it looks like that's the reason it says no recovery for an injured plaintiff. We had worried, and the law has worried sometimes, it looks like, because a tremendous amount of time or space may have intervened between the defendant's wrongful act and the plaintiff's harm complained of in the case. And sometimes it looks like that's why the law says no recovery for the injured plaintiff. And then at the very close of the last hour, we had said, and then too, there may be something else going on here. And this something else has now typically been labeled by a lot of people in the common law as the so-called risk rule rationale, R, R, R. The risk rule rationale. We had tried to state that as best we could and thereby to set the stage for what most people commonly concede to be the two most famous cases in the so-called law of proximate cause. The risk rule derived kind of from a statutory purpose analogy type rationale and employed in cases where there is no statute but rather plain old common law negligence. The risk rule rationale and what it comes to mean in a tort case. So that was kind of the method in the madness up to now in proximate cause. Of course it is very true, and Mr. Morris makes this point right forcefully in his book, that you run into a lot of cases where courts talk about proximate cause when really there is no what in the case. No W's in the crowd. 
There is no negligence in the case. If sometime, and that further, you see, confuses the entire issue. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to talk about lack of proximate cause when there is no negligence in the case to begin with. But a number of courts do it. You find the books cluttered with these kinds of cases. A further confusing point in the law. Then too, there is nothing scientific about the so-called risk rule rationale, is it? You can play around with that ambit of the risk, can you not? We call it in the common law, fooling around. <laughs> you can play around with that ambit of the risk, can you not? And make that ambit as broad or as narrow as a court might decide to make it in a given factual situation. And this is very easy. Morris again sets out some of those examples for you in that section of the book. Having done all that now and set the stage for the problem, let's then proceed to take a look at a couple of right famous cases in this area of the law. We come, first of all, to that well-known English case, In Re Polymus, a decision by the King's Bench back in 1921. Could we talk for a moment about that case, the Polymus case? Uh, do I have a W here, sure enough? Uh, is there a Mr. Story here? Oh, wonderful, Mr. Story. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs> Story, could, could we talk about N. Ray Polymus just for a moment? I won't keep you all. Could we talk about the Polymus case just for a moment? And I know, a little hard, just massage ball atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> but if you could, just for a moment, I'm going to try to blot them all out. There's just the four of us on a lonely island somewhere, me and you, and Harper and Jean. <laughs> now we don't ordinarily do anything this basic in a class in taught, but this time just for the benefit of a lot of folks who didn't even bring a book to play. <laughs> Would you give us the facts of the case? We don't ordinarily get this basic, but sort of set it out for us if you will. Now, would you? No. 
That's one answer. <laughs> Why not, Mr. Storm? How would you do this case? I'll interrupt now. How would you do this case under the risk room rationale? What would you say? What questions do you ask if you're going to apply risk rule to a factual situation? Foreseeability, and you tell me the King's Bench doesn't talk about foreseeability in this case? You don't believe that. Talk about it, but they don't really use it. Talk about it, but don't use it. Just fool around. <laughs> what question would you ask? We set it up last time for the risk room <laughs> rushing out. Question number one always is what? Well, all right, is the defendant negligent? And to answer that question, you ask whatever other question. Is the defendant negligent? Good. First question in the case. To, ans to answer that question, though, you've got to put another one. And what is that? No, no, if we're not. If we're talking about anything, we know it's not causation. Is it? No, we know that. Is the defendant negligent? You've said it. Now, what's the other question? Whether he should have foreseen that that injury would occur? Well, that's what we use to determine, right, if he was negligent in the first place, right? What is the reason we're going to label this defendant's conduct negligent in this case? <coughs> He's being held responsible for an act of his servant long and short. And that's the first question. Is it not? Why do we say, if we're going to say this, why do we say the defendant's longshoreman was negligent in this case? Answer, story. That what would occur? The injury which did occur. Oh, now, really, really, is that what the King's Bench says in this case? Is that the way it does it? It insists that this longshoreman, when he dropped the plank, had to foresee that the ship is going to be blown asunder. Is that what the King's Bench said? No, the King's Bench said that because he did it, you know, and that was the result, the right result. Of the All right, question one, risk rule rationale. Why do we say this defendant's servant longshoreman was negligent at all? Well... We say that because a reasonable longshoreman, or short shoreman, <laughs> a reasonable longshoreman would have foreseen if I drop this plank, what is likely to happen, Mr. Stork? Arbitrators have found this in the case. What is likely to happen? Someone may get hurt down below if I drop this plane. Two. The ship may be damaged. The ship may be damaged in some way if I drop this plane. Three. about dropping the plank. Ergo, we've got negligence in the case. He was negligent because a reasonable man would not have dropped the plank because he would have foreseen these dangers, these risks, as likely to eventuate. These are the anticipated hazards in the situation, are they not? Question number two under risk rule right now, Mr. Stark. All right, does this thing which has happened in this case, this damage being complained of by this point, does this thing, this danger, this risk come within 
the ambit of that danger we have already staked out, which makes us see the defendant's conduct was negligent conduct in the first place. Does it? No, it does not, and you're absolutely right. In this case, there's not a nice example of the risk rule rationale. The King's Bench refuses to follow that rationale. Congratulations, Dora. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't follow that rationale in the case, but rather says what? We don't care whether or not the eventual destruction, the spark from the petrol vapor, whether or not that could have been foreseen, that's not the question to us. There was some negligence of some sort, and that's enough. <coughs> From that negligence, we're prepared to say what? Liability extends as far as... As far as... What's the magic word? As far as anybody in Dublin... As far as anybody else. <laughs> the direct consequences of the negligent act. And look, the plank did fall. It did go into the hole of the ship. It did create a spark. That spark did ignite the escaping vapors. The ship did go up in flames. And that is direct consequences. So good, this is not a risk rule rationale at all. It's a broader holding of liability than risk rule, is it not? And the court makes it very clear that risk rule was urged upon it in this case and it rejected that approach to deciding the problem. So, test approach number four in proximate cause, what are we going to call it? The direct consequences approach. We've got four of them now. You can sort of take your pick. There is a smaller sport of approach. <laughs> the direct consequences rule and what that's going to be. How you would have solved the keys under the risk rule and how that probably would have terminated the defendant's liability much short of the place to which it was extended in this case as the English court decided. Good job, Mr. Story. Now, there may be one small further limitation on what we're seeing here. That is, it may still be possible to look at the polymer's case, even under the risk rule analysis. That is, it may be possible that advocates of the risk rule would still agree with the decision in the polymer's case. Do you know how we might work that out? You might see the polymer's keys as merely what kind of a situation. Mr. Seavey talks about it in the notes in your book. You might see the polymer's keys as merely what kind of a situation. You might see the polymer's keys as merely what kind of a situation. One where what? Rather than an entirely different kind of harm eventuated. Really, the harm that eventuated was just worse than the one that was anticipated. Or as C.D. says it, it really is an anybody. Extent of the damages keys rather than a different kind of damage keys. How might you rationalize the polymers that way? <coughs> What is our classic example? The thin skull keys, where you do what? Negligently drop a pencil. Negligently drop a pencil. It does what? Strikes A where? On the skull. We didn't know anything about it. Had no reason to know about A, but A happens to have what kind of a skull? A very thin skull. <laughs> and right before your eyes, A starts to what? Bloom, he's turned into a vegetable. <laughs> right before your eyes. <laughs> and the law has always said, even people who follow the risk group, has always said, what about that situation? 
that, well, whether or not it should have been foreseen, we just don't really care at this point because it is just an extent of the damages case and liability ought to cover that kind of a situation. How could you work out the polymer's case that way? What would you say about it? Absolutely, you might have said, in dropping the point that reasonable longshoremen would have at least had to foresee what? Some kind of physical damage to the ship. What is being complained of in the case? Physical damage to the ship, its ultimate destruction is. Worse physical damage than anticipated, but nevertheless, just an extent of the damage is given. You might look at it just that way. Anything wrong with looking at polymers that way? CD suggests that you can't. You agree with CD? so much about foreseeability then, but why can't you see the polymer's case that way? Because Lord Justice Banks, in the course of his opinion in polymer's, says what? Appellate's junior counsel. Did you know how he put that guy right down? <laughs> <laughs> Must be something like a law student. Appellate's junior counsel has urged upon the court what kind of an argument that there's a difference in what kind of a case? A case where the extent of the damages could not be foreseen on the one hand, and a case where a different kind of damage eventuated on the other. And appellate's junior counsel has urged on this court what, Mr. Starr? that we terminate the defendant's liability only in which kind of case? Where there is a different kind of damage eventuated rather than the extent of damages case. And then Lord Justice Banks says what? We reject that argument. Now I don't think you can look at Polymus the way C.D. tries to torture you that, do you? Lord Justice Banks seems to reject out of hand that very argument made in 1921 by counsel for the appellants in the case. Well, all right, Mr. Story. Thank you. Not a bad job. Thank you. The direct consequences rule in this round. <coughs> now, 1921, Polymus is decided in England. 1928, Paul's graph is decided in America. For low these half a hundred years since those two decisions, nobody has dared utter one without the other. They just run that way. Who would ever dream of talking about one of those cases without immediately referring to the other? It doesn't matter which order you take them in, they just go hand in hand. Nobody has ever thought in his wildest dreams that anything could ever separate those two cases in common law analysis. And yet, yet, this year, for the first time, the editors of your case book have published what? Maybe some of you bought it. <laughs> A supplement to the book. <laughs> Maybe some of you bought it. The editors of your case book published a supplement to the book. And in that supplement, they held the unmitigated goal and audacity to suggest what? That 
there is a key that should be considered between Polymus on the one hand and Paul's graph on the other. Have you read that case? Steinhauser against Hertz Corporation. Have you read that case? I have. <laughs> there are a number of ways I believe that that case can be treated. I am going to demonstrate to you one way to treat the case and what might be done with it. One thing you might want to do is mark your supplements. You will note here I've got a paper clip on the page in mind. You may want to spit on you, I don't think. <laughs> but at any rate, once you mark the page, it's kind of easy to do it. Because then you simply turn to that page grab the pages, and handle the kids. something of a reference sort of question. We are now going to talk about a case, maybe you've heard about it. We are now going to talk about a case which is a very famous sort of case, and yet that's such an understatement you almost hate to say. A famous case, well of course it is. But that's such an understatement you start to wonder at some point, how can you really and truly indicate the significance of this case to a group of people such as you. <laughs> how could you know? How could you appreciate anything? You're just law students. Lowest form of life known to the common law. <laughs> now, how could anybody tell you, impress upon you, the importance of the next case? Oh, you could say it's the most important case in the law of proximate cause. That would be true, but it wouldn't do. Or you could say it's the most important case in tort law. That would be true, but it wouldn't do. You could say that, oh, it's the most important case in all the law. And that would be true, but it wouldn't do. <laughs> I don't know how you go about indicating the importance of this case, and I'm not going to try. I will say this. You might consider Paul's graph as merely the most famous case decided in the free world. <laughs> Was that good? I don't. <laughs> At any rate, along with its importance, you have to understand this. It has become over the years a very emotional sort of thing with me. There are things about the keys that simply link us together, me and Paul's grab, down through the years. There's no way you can appreciate that. I don't expect you to, but you have to give me my due at this point and talk about it in hushed and silent tone. <clears throat> no, a number. You wouldn't believe some of the things that have happened to me because of this case. You just wouldn't believe it. Why, I still remember that snowy, I still remember that snowy Paul's graph Eve not too many years ago. First time it ever happened. I think it's about the first time I ever read Paul's graph. I still remember that snowy Paul's graph Eve when at about 11 o'clock there was a knock on the door and of course I'm there as I always am at that point frantically reading the keys one more time in hope that there is some noise somewhere I have missed in the opinion. The knock on the door, you go there and there of course is Western Union. You know what he's got? You know what he's got? A singing telegram. <laughs> singing telegram. Reads like this. Good luck tomorrow. I'm right behind you. Signed, Mrs. Porter. <laughs> I looked over my shoulder for two weeks after that. <laughs> I mean, this has an impact on a person. You can't appreciate this sort of thing until it happens to you. Of course, at this point, everybody has tried to get into the act. A few years later, this one came. Dear Mr. Centel, $1,500 if you'll throw the keys. Signed, <laughs> <laughs> Rockaway.
Bay Beach Jingle Company. <laughs> I mean, you know, there is no way I could ever indicate to you the importance of this case to me personally. Our histories are simply too intertwined. Last night, last night, <laughs> last night, 10.45 in the evening, a delegation of the Coors type, you know them, <laughs> a Coors type delegation cavorting around my front lawn <laughs> with a verse all posed about Paul's graph, something twas the night before Paul's <laughs> There is just no way you can know it. No way. Oh, I still remember the first time. I still remember the first time Valentine's Day rolled around. Of course, now it happens on every occasion. Never does an occasion pass. Valentine's, Christmas, Thanksgiving, Memorial Day, Daytona 500. It doesn't matter if I your onion date. Ed McMurray Greyhound bus date. Always on any occasion I receive some communication about the Paul Graham case. I wouldn't dare try to bore you with all of them. Just one small example. It's addressed, of course, Mrs. Paul's graph and the girls, care of Professor Sintel. You look at it, and it is a valentine. Small, but it's hallmark. Small, <laughs> small, but it's hallmark. And it simply says, the message is a pithy one. It simply says, to my teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and on the back, scrawled out in some sort of long hand, there is Andrew's J. <laughs> and down below the line, Bar Humbug Cardozo. <laughs> uh, now, there's no way I can tell you what the Paul's graph case has come to mean to me over the years. You just really couldn't believe. You just wouldn't appreciate it. I still remember. I still remember the first time this happened. Down between the hedges on a Saturday afternoon. You know what better way to, you know. Watching the dogs roll to yet another victory. I remember. <laughs> it was a long time. But I remember that Christmas clear autumn afternoon, I can tell you virtually every play of the first half. I remember it that well. Slant to the left, slant to the left. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> On two consecutive plays, our defensive line rose up and prevented a first down. That's how long ago it was. <laughs> I can tell you virtually every play, but you know what happened? At the half, that God awful loudspeaker system down there that they have, at the half, this blaring announcement came on, Professor Sintel, please call Mrs. Paul. <laughs> I don't even remember the second half. I understand it has happened since that time. I don't know. I'll never go, because I don't go. <laughs> so you'll never see me between the hedges again. So there's no way for me to indicate to you the importance of this case to me. I'll simply have to ask you to take my word for it. It's a famous case. We come now to the point in the proceedings where it's necessary. <clears throat> what a privilege this is on my part each year. <laughs> to tap the person whose responsibility it is now to recite on the Paul's graph case. There is only one of these during each first year talk. The Paul's graph person, as we refer to <laughs> That time now right. What an honor. I mean, I can't tell you what an honor it is that attaches itself to this particular unfit. 
what benefits, what tangential rewards there are, why, of course, they are many. Simply putting on your resume that you're excited for the lowest level will open the door to any law firm in this country. That's the kind of honor, that's the kind of reward that attaches to reciting on the Paul Grant team. Now, at the same time, along with honor comes responsibility. And that mantle of responsibility is now about to be placed upon someone's shoulders for 1975. The Paul's Graph person of 75. We are about to designate that person. What a job. What a responsibility. <laughs> Following in the shoes of people. People like the one you saw up here operating this country. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, there's so many things you can say about the Paul's graph person, awfully hard to know where to stop. I think my friend, he's Paul's graph person now himself, you know Chris Christopherson, do you? I think probably Chris said it best in a little soliloquy he wrote at one point. Perhaps you heard it and didn't know what he was applying it to. I think Christopherson said it best. It's entitled why me, boy? <laughs> Long time ago, I also decided that, you know, this is a responsibility I can't undertake by any arbitrary determination. No, this has to be the luck of the draw. That's the only way we could do it. You have people coming by threatening to do away with themselves because they weren't called upon to decide on the kid. No. I am not personally going to take that kind of responsibility anymore. So, a long time ago, we devised the method, and it is simply this. I will close my eyes, look away, put my hand down on the seating chart, and well, it may be someone who's already been called on six times. It may be someone who hasn't been called upon at all. We throw away the record book at this point. All right, let's do that for 1975. <laughs> Well, all right, I'm happy to make the announcement. The Paul's graph person for 75 is Mr. Kendrick. <laughs> Yet, despite these victories, the cruel and callous castrators move the cold calculation to kill, freeze, and wind down urban renewal, model cities, community action, public service employment, student bonds, public housing federal impact funds for education, and to impose a 60% national pullback. If we are to believe with Thomas Jefferson that the common man is the most precious portion of the state, we find that precious resource in real danger of economic extinction today. <coughs> Human problems are now placed on a balance sheet, forced to add up, to pay profit for themselves. The new and special effect. So a long time ago, somebody suggested half the class would softly hum. <laughs> the other half a soft whistle, if you will. And it doesn't have to be anything sophisticated, some simple little. Do you know? Heel to the chief. <laughs> Go ahead now, Mr. Kendricks. Give us what you've got on Paul. Well, it seems like Mrs. Paul's graph was standing on this railroad platform in the Long Island Railroad. Two gentlemen were... Mr. Kendricks. <laughs> <laughs> the vibes are not good. <laughs> Don't you all know this? I don't insist on much in this class. You come when you want to, and you stay home when you want to. <laughs> you straggle in during the hour at any time. It's convenient to 
you <laughs> sit wherever you want to, you may bring a book, you may not. <laughs> if it's a book, it may be a toy book, it may be a Harlequin romance. <laughs> the the, the imposing insult was the day someone brought a contract book, but even that, <laughs> even that I ordinarily forgive, I insist on very little. But Mr. Kendricks, you are treating this case like any other case. If I've done anything during the course of this hour, it is to indicate this is not like any other court case. This one's special. You've got to put something extra into this case when you come to it. There is just no other way to treat it. In some sort of a humdrum manner to say, Plaintiff Mrs. Paul's graph standing on the station. That doesn't sound right. <laughs> That's not what you need to say when you talk about this case. You've got to identify with the parties in this case. There's just no other way. <clears throat> Do you know who Mrs. Paul's graph was? Do you appreciate her for the human being she was? Do you? What, 43 years old, lived in Brooklyn all her life, a housewife, a mother, and each morning at 8 o'clock, and she stayed there until 5, she would go to the heart of the city and earn her daily bread by virtue of following her chosen profession, a janitress in a large office building. <laughs> That is the way this woman spent her days. Do you imagine what kind of a life that was? You think it's exciting to go in and scrub those floors each day? Do you? Sort of the Carol Burnett of Torquo. <laughs> <laughs> you think that's an exciting way to spend your time? Hoping somebody will speak to you, but they rarely do. Maybe once a week somebody will come by and say, Helen, get the lights off. But that's about it. That's about it. I mean, how many rendezvous can you have with a tidy bull man? <laughs> no, that's about it. Helen falls crap. Why, this woman's life soaked up sorrow the way a bounty paper towel. <laughs> Helen falls crap. 43 years old, standing there though on this given morning, well, on a railroad platform. And what's she there for, and who's with her? Who's with her, Mr. Kendricks? Well, those two little girls. You can almost see them, if you will squint. You can almost see them. What? Lillian, 15 years old. Elizabeth, 12. You can almost see those little girls standing there holding the hands of their mother. Both with those stark <clears throat> pentaphors standing in the way, their little hair braided in plaits, those black patent leather shoes sparkling, all excited, grasping their mother's hand, waving their little railroad ticket, saying, What? We're going to Rockaway Beach. <laughs> you can almost see it, can you not, this summer morning in August in 1921. You can almost see it, can you not, the excitement, the enthusiasm, the anticipation of the team. When you say plaintiff, that's who you mean. When you say Mrs. Paul's grab, that's who you mean. You would be shortchanging her to talk about her in any other way. You have got to identify with the parties. I don't know, I've always thought. We built a law building here not too many years ago. We are now talking about making additional space. I have always thought that the most valuable part of any law building would be a room, of course, it would be packed. <laughs> a room set apart somehow in some sort of isolation. Where, you know, on those days when just nothing goes right, you could go in there and sit and meditate. And of course, we call it the Paul's Graph Room. <laughs> we need a Paul's Graph Room in this law school. You might make your views known to the administration. 
a pole, a broom closet, anything. We set for a pole forever. Just seems to me we need that sort of thing in this law school. Then too, you ought to know this. A certain aura attaches to this case. I have told you about the significance of the keys in my life, but I can tell you this. Each of you now become Paul's draft carriers yourself. Because <laughs> now you have been exposed to the keys. And strange things happen when you talk about the Paul's draft. Oh, I can tell you stories. They all leave like they would walk your frisbees. I, I, <laughs> you wouldn't believe about the aura around the Paul draft meetings. You know, one of the nice things about being a law teacher is that you often meet the wives and husbands of your students. And that's one of my pleasures always. I'll never forget the time this beautiful <coughs> young thing came up and said, Oh, Professor Sintel, let me tell you, we just got a, a new cat at home. And my husband has named her Mrs. Paul. And he won't tell me what that means, but I was wondering if you would. Now, what can I tell <laughs> What would you have told her, knowing what we know about the Paul's draft piece? Well, you know, you put her off as best you can, you hope for the best, but on the next social occasion, you know what she's going to say, and she did. Oh, Professor, Mrs. Paul's draft has died. And over on the other side of the punch bowl, smirking, grinning in his own way, that husband who later came by and said, I never liked the damn cat No, there's an horror about this case. You just couldn't believe it. And you say, standing on the defendant's railroad station platform, Railroad, is that any way to refer to the defendant in this case? A railroad company? Why, do you know what railroad company this is? This is the Long Island Railroad. And of all railroad companies, this one is special. You just wouldn't believe the stories they tell about the Long Island Railroad. Everybody has his own philosophy about Long Island. You may know that philosopher on the modern day scene who's always commenting on contemporary life, Carson J. <laughs> <laughs> Carson J. has a theory, a philosophy about the Long Island Railroad, and it goes this way. <clears throat> he says, you can walk out on the sidewalks of New York on any given morning, and stamp your three feet three times on the sidewalk, and 15 cars of the Long Island Railroad will promptly fall off the track. <laughs> I believe that. I believe that. It's that kind of a railroad company we're talking about here. Oh, listen, it hasn't been that long. What, three, four years ago, they made a national study of the effectiveness of commuter rail service in this country. A nationwide study. Do you know what the conclusion was? Do you? The single worst commuter service by far, wasn't even close, by far was the Long Island Railroad. The single worst. There was a guy then serving as governor of the state. You don't hear much about him anymore. He sort of faded away. His name was Rockefeller. <laughs> At that time, he was serving as governor of the state, however, and he said, Fella, only guy I ever saw speak to a study and call it Fella. <laughs> fella, no man, he calls everybody Fella. Fella, he said, I promise you that as governor, I will either make this the best commuter service in this country or I will quit. <laughs> <laughs> so when you say when you say railroad, Mr. Kendricks, that's who you're talking about. Now we're almost out of time. I've sort of blown the hour here just reminiscing with you. Would you though, before we adjourn, give us very quickly the facts in the case? 
putting that little extra mm into it, if you would. These two men were running across the station to catch the train. While, uh, the train started to pull out. The first man got on board. There was a villain defendant holding the door open. The first man made it. The second man with a package under his arm. Uh, tried to get on. He wasn't going to quite make it, so the defendant villain pulled him on. Another one pushed him on from the outside. The package fell underneath the train, it blew up, and the other end of the platform, some scales fell over, <coughs> supposedly due to the explosion, uh, it held. <laughs> <laughs> That's the key. That's the key. Case goes to trial, she sues the Long Island Railroad, and do you know what the result was in the trial court? She won. Sure. She won, and she won how much? $6,000. A verdict affirmed down below for $6,000. Can you imagine what $6,000 meant to a woman like Helen Paul's graph in 1928? Can you appreciate that? $6,000. It then starts up the appellate level and goes through a number of courts. In all, how many judges passed on the case? 13. How many of those 13 thought Mrs. Paul's graph should keep her $6,000? Seven. Seven of them. Yet that's not the way it works out because of one man on the New York Court of Appeals. And who is he? Mr. Cardozo. Judge Benjamin Cardozo. Or, as Lillian was later to grow up to refer to him, Stingy Benjamin. <laughs> <laughs> Who virtually reaches over her shoulder and extracts the $6,000 from her hand. No, you don't recover in this case, and here's why. Do you remember, Mr. Henderson? The other day, somebody in Section W, who was Mr. Howell, said... You know, when we talked about Harvey Hines poised on that springboard to dive into the water, the Mark Spitz of tort law, we call it. <laughs> you recall we talked about Harvey Hines and how it was the judge in that case let him recover. Do you recall what Mr. Howard said about the judge? Called him what? Sentimental man. Sentimental man. <laughs> Wanting Harvey to recover against the railroad company in that case. Why, if you'd like to reach across the aisle and hit him, you may. <laughs> now, there are some other points, believe it or not, about the case, but those aren't nearly as amusing. We'll talk about some of those next time, and I know Mr. Kendrick will continue with his usual fine performance. As we conclude this hour, though, I thought I might close out by just reading to you for a moment. A little thing that appears at the end of a book done by Professor Robert Keaton on legal calls in tort law, at the very end entitled An Epilogue to Paul Gray. Now, Mr. Keaton is the editor of a case book in tort. We don't use it, but some people do. From that case book, I had extracted that little picture that I sent around on the roll this morning, sort of describing the Paul's graph situation. He says that shortly after he published that case book with that picture in it, he received from an unknown source the following letter. I would like to read to you one or two excerpts from that letter, dear sir. A few days ago, I picked up a copy of your publication from the gutter near where I live in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> it was just lying there, fresh and clean looking, and it made me wonder why somebody would throw away anything like that without even turning enough pages to get fingerprints on it. A man in my line of work naturally thinks about fingerprints. <laughs> well, imagine my surprise when I thumbed through it and saw it was a lot of short, short stories. Some pretty live ones, too, in spite of the fact that you seem to like only stories with legal gimmicks. <laughs> I even thought for a minute that it might be some kind of a law book, but then I saw the cartoon. <laughs> what I want to tell you is that your cartoon and story about the woman being hit by the scales on the subway platform, 
when the guards knocked a package of fireworks out of a fellow's hand, gave me a real man. That was a very realistic story. You guys deserve a Howard surprise. <laughs> I once saw something like that myself. In fact, for a moment, I thought you had just written up the deal I saw. But when I read on a bit more, I discovered that couldn't be so. Me and my buddies, we were what you would probably call juveniles. We were playing a game, something like that game of Rush, described in another one of your stories. One kid starts pushing another, and he pushes somebody else, till pretty soon you have a whole line headed hell-bent for a crash against some poor sucker who's looking the other way. <laughs> the subway was a great place to play this game. People were always running to catch trains. If you timed the rush right, it wouldn't be too bad if a guard collared you because you could always get away with that, who, me? I was just trying to catch a train routine. Well, one day we misfired. And instead of hitting a sucker, we hit some scales on the station platform. <laughs> and they fell over and hit this dame with her two kids. Fortunately, somebody set off some fireworks just then. It was real funny. <laughs> it was real funny. This queen says to one of her two little girls, What happened to Lydia? And some deep voice, timed just right to sound like it was Lydia answering, says, It's a hell of a way to run a railroad. <laughs> in the confusion, in the confusion, we took it on the land. I've always felt a little guilty about that especially since those kids were so wide-eyed and cute. But I don't suppose my staying around would have made any difference anyway. Do you? And the aggressiveness of our local district attorney I build your lecture as the Georgia Law of Incorporal Heredivus. <laughs> <laughs> we're delighted to have you in Athens, and I hope we'll return again soon. Thank you very much, Lester.